Hey, and welcome to another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Jake. I'm Josh. And we're back. We've got another interview, this time with the creative team of the Image Comics series, The Beauty, Jeremy Hahn and Jason Hurley. Uh, this is, you know, you know, we had the review posted last week, so if you want to know what we thought about the book itself, the series itself, check that out. I will say that uh, we do kind of go really spoiler heavy, so if you're really interested in The Beauty, and but you don't want to know about it, just stick with the review. We go pretty spoiler light. And then, you know, read the book and then listen to what they actually have to say about it, which is this. And joining us this week, we've got the creative team of The Beauty, Jeremy Hahn and Jason Hurley. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. So this is like, this was a book that had started out as part of the, uh, as part of the Top Cow um, pilot season program back in 2011. Um, how... How does it? Uh, and then you, of course, succeeded in bringing it into a full series. Jason, this is your this is your comic book writing debut. How, how does it? Uh, th- was this something that was always kind of rattling in your head? Uh, yeah, I, it was a an idea that Jeremy came up with a long time ago, and we worked out uh, how to do it on a, over the course of a long car ride, and then, like you say, did something with it about four years ago. Did the, the pilot season first issue and and finally years and years later we're we're able to break it out into a full series it's pretty awesome and uh i mean of course jeremy you've got quite a bit of experience you've uh drawn for for dc you've drawn a lot of a lot of bat stuff now that i think about it like uh, batwoman streets of gotham all that sort of detective comics um with this story i mean at times it can be it can be darker but this is certainly probably the most brutal uh, thing that you've uh, drawn, t- at least to my knowledge. Um, what was it about? Uh, what was really your inspiration for both visualizing and just coming up with the story with Jason? Well, I think this is a lot. You know, these are the kinds of stories that we like to tell. Um, you know, I've done a lot of mainstream stuff. I mean, I, I did. Well, I was I was on uh, the Dark Mess at Top Cow for a little over a year. And, you know, I've done various things along the way that are, that are pretty brutal, uh, beyond my mainstream stuff. Um, when, you know, it kind of for me, a lot of it goes back to movies. It's always the, the kind of movies that I like to watch. And typically I'm drawn to stuff that, that tends to be a little bit, uh, harder edged and, uh, you know, I, you know, crime oriented. Hmm. And now both of you, I mean, especially in the liner notes for this first volume, um, and of course you've got Scott Snyder talking about the importance of horror in the introduction. So I take it both of you guys are pretty big horror movie fans? Oh, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys have – I mean, we, every time we have, like when we had Tim Seeley yeah, and stuff on. that seems to be a reoccurring theme that like all of the talent we have on are huge horror fans yeah. for the most part, <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, do you guys have, if you, okay, because we, we always forward this question to people that kind of have a stated interest in horror. Who who wins in this, or who's your favorite? Jason Voorhees, Mike Myers, or Freddy Krueger? <laughs> you go first, Hurley. Uh, Michael Myers. Nice. Absolutely. I, and, and based solely on the, the first movie, even. Yeah. I like, agree with that. Yeah, I, I think it's toward the end of any of those franchises, they all kind of become parodies of themselves. But you know, I, I feel like Michael Myers is the best of those. It, it's you know, I I, I kind of love all three, but I will have to say Michael Myers too. I'm not to be not to be clean sweep and, and agree too much with Hurley. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> you know, they're they're all pretty great icons, but and, and work in very different ways, but. Uh, Halloween was really the the one the movie that that kind of got me, and uh, you know it's it's pretty much been my constant favorite since I first saw. Oh, and I will say though, if you take all of those series, if you take the series as a whole, I think the Friday the Thirteenth as a series holds up better. Interesting, interesting. So, yeah. Do you have a is is yeah? Which one's your favorite of the Friday the Thirteenth series? Uh, is it five that takes Manhattan? 
Takes Takes Manhattan. Manhattan. I love that one like oh. because it's so bad. Yeah, my favorite Jason <laughs> moment. My favorite Jason moment is 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 in Takes Manhattan where he's walking down Times Square and he just kicks the boombox and those kids are like, "Hey, man!" Yeah. And he turns around, and he just shows them their face and puts it down. They're like, "We're sorry, man." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the flying V. Well, even you... some. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Even some of those that, that took really weird turns, um, you know, along the way. A lot of a lot of the Friday Thirteenth movies had some really great moments. Uh, you know, I mean, even even the one uh, where uh, it takes place at, at you know the the home for delinquent kids. Uh, oh yeah, you know, New Blood or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where, where yeah. it's not even e- Jason. Even though that took a right, right, it took such a strange turn, but but it still really worked and it was pretty fun. So. I don't know. I, I did them. <laughs> Would you guys say that Mr. Calaveras is kind of like a nod to guys like Mike Myers and Jason Voorhees? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. That definitely. Yeah. Well, a- anybody that, that, you know, it, when you have a killer in a mask like that, when, when they have a completely emotionless face, uh, you know, it, it has to be a nod to those flashers. Well, Jake referred to... Well, we've co- seen the- yeah. Well, you were saying? Oh, I was going to say, yeah. It just it just seems like you know a lot of our stuff. We always like to throw some kind of character in a mask doing terrible things. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, Jake had you know when we were reading the book, Jake turned to me and goes like, "Calaveras is probably the most polite serial killer I think I've ever seen." He just has like this night like this nice little charm to him. Um, you know, all you know, doing horrible things. But I he was like for me. I'm such a sucker for like a masked character in anything good, evil, whatever. And just his look, his design and like the way he would like congratulate the sniper, you know, Oh, you know, good job. Good job. You know, and just the, the little things like the little touches like that are what made him so much more than just another masked killer. In my opinion, we're going to have to eventually go back and uh, do a one-off and kind of let, let everybody see, you know, where he kind of comes from, because I'm so, um, I'm he's, so a down for that. He's, he's a horrible, horrible, he's a terrifying human being. I mean, he's just absolutely brutal. But, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, we, that, that is that one of, definitely one of the most common questions that we get is, is about his origin, mm-hmm. where he came from, why he is the way he is. So. Without, I mean, well, you know, and you've got a, you've got a, well, yeah, you've no, got a character continue. that, um, has a lot of charisma, you know, and and but then he looks the way he does, and you're like, oh, that's that's just a mess, you know. We kind of wanted to eventually get to the point where we're showing you where he comes from. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, even though I'm I'm like 100 percent down, like I, I I love that you guys said that, but I did like though just reading like reading the first volume, and one of the cool things was like not knowing any of that. Like uh, it was something that I really right. enjoyed, like the anonymity, like you know, he just is this guy, and he's just this presence, and like. You know, when 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 uh, the characters in the in the book are are kind of told of as a presence is really the first time we're told of it, and that we kind of share the similar like "oh fuck" moment, you know. And I think that just that just worked really well. I will say, I mean, you don't have to give the game away too much, but is his appearance kind of you know beyond the the skull mask? Um, is that kind of tied to the or, or tied to the cure for the beauty? No, no, not really. I mean, he's, again, it's us playing with vanity. It's us playing with with um, how people look and, and how they're perceived. And uh, you've got this guy that that is a monster, both you know, in, in the way that he looks, but also even, even more just in, in his actions. Um, you know, we... Along the way, we wanted to examine characters and kind of how, how they worked within this world and how they viewed beauty. This is a guy that that is a monster himself and sees beautiful things and wants to destroy them. He w- w- both worship and destroy them, which I think is, is an even more interesting you know, character aspect. And moving forward, are we going to start to see? Because it after this volume, you guys come back in in May. I was curious to see what the because um, even though spoilers for volume one, if you don't want any spoilers, skip ahead like a minute or so. Even though Calaveras is presumably down for the count, 
his employers aren't. So I presume like going moving forward, are we going to see more about the the organization behind his employment? Are we going to start to see more of the kind of the anti beauty movement and that sort of thing? Well, a lot of what we're going to do with the series now um, is actually show different periods of time. We're more interested in examining things in the two years between the uh, the time that we see the beauty, uh, you know, start to appear, and the moment of the cure. And um, the next arc actually takes place uh, about a year and a half before the first one. So we get to meet some new characters and kind of see how they interact with the beauty. That's cool. That means. Could we potentially see Calaveras again? Because we we were literally like looking at it and we understood. Yeah. <laughs> I swear I, I I noticed other characters in the book. It's just that I've I really dug Calaveras. I thought he was a fascinating character. Yeah, and we character. were kind of bummed to see him go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I think he's definitely something we'll get back to. Uh, I I think he's a character that will show back up, but we're kind of gonna bounce around in time for a while. Like Jeremy said, we were showing kind of the end of this two-year cycle of the disease uh, in the first arc, and then and we kind of want to go back and show some of the, the earlier stories when, you know, before half the world had the beauty. It was just coming about, and, and people didn't, you know, really know what was going on yet. Well, come on. Really, with Calaveras, how can we, how can we not come back to him before too long? No, I yeah. Mean, <laughs> yeah, there's that, too. I, we we <laughs> love him, too, so... <laughs> And I think it's kind of fantastic with these with these characters. You know, you 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 bring somebody in, and you're like, oh, they're going to be one thing, and then and then you you don't want to lose them. You know, and sometimes the story dictates, uh, you know, having having to have a character meet their end. But um, it's kind of fun along the way to fall in love with characters and then and then want more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was very interesting seeing that, you know, Foster, again, spoilers, The it, it's it's everywhere March 16th. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a, like, preemptive <laughs> thing before we start the interview. We'll yeah. Um, it was interesting seeing Foster get, you know, infected at the end of the first issue because then knowing from the outset that everyone is, that has the beauty, which is a, at least two-thirds of the American population, mm-hmm. is infected – that sets up that that ticking clock. So it'll be interesting to yeah see what what it's like before the the clock ticks, or at least before they're aware well, of it. When when we originally started this series, or well before even when we originally started talking about the series, we wanted to do a little bit more of a slow burn, and then we um, started talking with Top Cow about doing the pilot season issue, and we were like, oh, we've really got like. You're doing a pilot season issue. That, that's one. That's one chance to really, you know, punch people in the nuts to get their attention. And um, and you know, so we had to really, really, you know, dial it up. And so that ticking clock that we introduce, you know, th- there was no way around that. Once you know, once we started that, and then um, and then people loved the series and. We were, you know, we always hoped that we could do more than just the initial first arc of six issues. Uh, but, but then we get to, and and that's that's perfect. But now we're going to go back and examine all of that other stuff that we kind of wanted to, and you're going to get to see, you know, you're going to see Foster and Vaughn earlier in their their career, and you're going to get to see, um, you know, different elements. You're going to see how how the beauty worked within the crime world. You're going to get to see how um, early glimpses at, you know, some of some of the questions that we have about the pharmaceutical organization, the bosses and stuff like that. Kind of like, we get to play with it all. We get to, you know, take our time with it, which is nice. Yeah. Speaking of the book success, you guys do have one of my probably – favorite variant covers um, in recent memory where you're both spoofing the sex criminals uh, variant <laughs> cover. <laughs> we don't know what you're talking about, man. That's a secret. <laughs> That's right. It's the secret variant. My, my mistake, yeah. <clears throat> uh, no. Well, no, actually. It's, it's, 
by this point, first of all, we're we're showing it. Uh, it's going to be in the cover gallery in, in the book, um, right. in the trade. Um, and you know, people have people have kind of broken their vow and showed it around. So you know, <laughs> yeah, sure, we did we did actually make people promise not to tell anyone what the cover was. I think about it. <laughs> Bought it from a flea con. Yeah. So. And actually, you know, until and until New York Comic Con, really nobody nobody really shared it. It was amazing. We we yeah, we've been good to, did, it's three months with it actually being secret. So yeah, it was cool. Nice. <laughs> and, and you know, but then you get to New York Comic Con, people are wanting to sell it on eBay and stuff. So whatever happens, you know, that's fine. But we we actually did that because um, we knew that we wanted to do one a, a variant that was just fun and kind of ultra limited and just for us. And we thought what better way to do it than to kind of take the piss out of, out of Matt and Chip and their uh, <laughs> sex criminals cover. <laughs> the, so, what? well, I, I was, I was thinking, so Jason, like I was saying earlier, this is kind of your debut, but you had been working in the comics industry as a retailer for years, like running your own shop in in Missouri, had there always kind of been that itch to kind of like go pro? Um, kind of, yeah. I uh, it's a thing that I always thought would be really cool, and just never, um, particularly had the opportunity or the or the time to go after it while while running a store full time. Um, but you know, the, the opportunity came up, and I, I couldn't pass it out. You know, when somebody says, "Hey, you want to." You want to write a comic book? You don't say now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm. uh, and I was kind of surprised because, and I'm and I'm interested in, that you guys are going back in time because the first arc really kind of has the kind of ending where, if you theoretically wanted to, and I'm glad, absolutely glad, we're getting more beyond issue six. It there is kind of almost a finite sense to the ending, with at the end of issue at the end of this first arc. Do you ever see yourself, you know, obviously you're talking about doing flashbacks. Do you ever see, see yourself moving forward in time? We talked about it. Um, I think that we know to a degree where it would go. Um, the thing there, I mean, it's like, you know, we, we cure it. We've, we've shown, you know, we, we once, once, once people read it, once they see that ending, you know, those... Gosh, we really are spoiler heavy, aren't we? Here, um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, yeah, all the uh, warnings. All warnings. Yeah, um, the, I think the next step for the book um, after that loses a little bit of the impact, um, but we know where it would go, and, and I think that it's something that we do kind of want to examine if we've got the time to do it. If, if you know, if we get the chance. It may just be little glimpses. Um, I really would like to deal with with the spread of the cure, and even like people knowing that it's coming. Um, how all that works, you know. And I'd love to. And I, and I would love to see a, a world a few years later, um, a world where the, I, the beauty standards have massively changed. We're now something different, but. Uh, I don't know. It, it just you know depends on how much how much time we have and and uh, how many chances we get to, to tell more stories. We've got so many stories that we want to tell about the two year period uh, between you know the onset and the cure. Sure, uh, we'll see. Now, this is something we try to ask every single person we have on the show. What are you guys currently geeking out over? Early, how about it? <laughs> oh, I get to go first, huh? <laughs> um, I I recently rebought V and V the Final Battle on uh, on DVD. I've been watching those on repeat pretty constantly. So my major thing that I'm going through right now is a 30 year old miniseries, TV miniseries. <laughs> so that's really what I'm geeking out on right now. I actually bought some of the novels that I've never had before too. So. <laughs> Very topical. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it frighteningly though? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's see. Uh I'm really into uh I actually just started the second season of Fargo. Mm. 
and that show is absolutely brilliant. Uh, first season, it, uh, you know, good crime series. Uh, it, it felt like the movie in a way that I, I didn't think that they could do. Um, you know, it had the Coen Brothers blessing, but it wasn't actually from the Coen Brothers. Uh, and I just, I love that first season. And then the second season even seems like it's going to be better. Plus you get Ronald. Yeah, TV you, wise up. Yeah. I mean, you get Bruce Campbell as Ronald Reagan, so <laughs> you can't really complain too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are, are, you, are you guys watching uh, Ash vs. the Evil Dead? I watched the whole thing and it was amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't started it yet. It's in, I, I actually just downloaded all of it, so so uh, I'm going to tear into it pretty soon. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It was a it was a nice mix between the like uh, like hardcore like horror roots of the first Evil Dead and like the kind of like fun campy uh, horror of Evil Dead Two, uh, just uh, spread across almost. I think eight or ten hours worth of television. It was wonderful. Yeah, I just want to check that out. Well, without sounding too much like a creeper or more than usual, <laughs> Jason, I saw that you were <laughs> you listed like Freddie Mercury as one of the you know things that you, we're we're pretty big Queen fans uh, over <laughs> here. Do you have a favorite Queen album? Uh, I, yeah, a lot of the stadium. Nice. Because um, uh, Freddie Mercury is, while well, well, I love his songwriting, uh, his live performances are where it's at. Yeah. Fr- Freddie Mercury live is like nothing else. I mean, I, I assume, I never actually saw him live, obviously, but, mm. uh, you know, but uh, I had the, uh, I actually still have a, a poster of the, the things in my office that is, is a screenshot from Live at Stadium. So. That's one of my favorite moments from Live at Wembley Stadium is when they play Big Spender and they make it like the heaviest song ever and Freddie is just like <laughs> doing the strip tease and like it's so heavy and awesome and uh and another thing like about just like live Freddie that I love is when they did um was it Live Aid and they had like no sound check like you know everyone was like you know Paul McCartney was playing there you know Bowie everyone else and if you watch that performance they come in and they just slay everybody in like you know fifteen twenty minutes. It's like you know like I guess that's constantly referred to as like the greatest gig of all time. Speaking of just like live yeah. Freddie, but um, they also they released something. Uh, I haven't picked it up yet, but um, they they did like a um, live night at the opera that they released. I think recently, like on vinyl and CD and DVD, where I guess they play like a night at the opera in its entirety as much as they can because they write some songs that oh, can't wow. be played live. But yeah, I saw like a vinyl yeah, thing of yeah. it. And um, I mean, a night at the, I mean, I know it's like the obvious choice, but a night at the opera is like my favorite queen album and probably my favorite guitar album of all time. But yeah, they, I think that's the most recent live queen thing that they've unearthed. So. That's excellent. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. You got any uh, musical things going on, uh, Jeremy, anything you listen to while you're penciling? Um, you know, I kind of bounce around. I do a lot of, uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts, which is, you know, apt. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I do a ton of podcasts. I listen to, you know, uh, WTF with Mark Marin a lot. I listen to, I've got a couple of, uh, screenwriting podcasts that I like. I, I enjoy the, uh, script notes podcast with, uh, John August and Craig Mazin. Um, I've been getting into recently a lot of these like uh, horror uh, story-based podcasts, like Limetown and uh, the Black Tapes. I actually hardly got me into those. Um, as far as music goes, um, I am really all over the place. It's kind of ridiculous. I, I just like I, I liked Mogwai, but. Um, Recently, I like really got into them to write to because it's you know that that kind of sort of heavy, uh, pretty epic, um, you know, instrumental stuff. It, it's really nice. To, I, can't, I can't for the life of me, I can't write to anything with uh, any kind of you know uh, lyrics at all. It, it, my, yeah. I start listening and I just can't. <laughs> yeah. 
it's terrible. Um, but, uh, you know, of course, with losing Bowie, uh, I kind of dipped back into his discography and I've been just re-listening to all of that, you know. Do you have a favorite <laughs> period of, a favorite period at all within Bowie's chronology? Um, you know, I mean, he's a, you know, geez, he's a guy that, uh, along the way reinvented himself like no other performer. I mean, he, he always stayed relevant and always was just so ahead of the game. Um, you know, Ziggy Stardust was, was probably, you know, uh, was probably my favorite little bit there. Um, but, um, you know, like just even thinking about like Aladdin Sane and stuff like that, those albums, how, how strong they were and kind of the ones that I keep going back to. Um, uh, the new one is fantastic too, though. I mean, it, it's, it's heartbreaking, you know, knowing, knowing that, that he knew that the, the end was coming and stuff, uh, as a goodbye album. It, it's fantastic, but it, uh, kind of still wrecks me to listen to. Yeah. I mean, it really is kind of, especially when you look at the, you look at the, uh, the, the Lazarus video and stuff where he's mm-hmm. literally on his deathbed. Oof. Yeah. Um, so in terms of, uh, Outside of the, or is it the beauty for you two guys looking forward, or is there any other projects on the horizon that you guys are uh, willing to share or, uh, or or announce? Uh, well, you know, it's always that weird thing where stuff's in the works and you can't say too too much. But we're both working on some stuff. Uh, are you going to give me hints to what you're working on? Um, I've, I've been listening to a lot of Viking metal lately, <laughs> and, and listening to that while I write because it's relevant. <laughs> whole, whole lot of amount of marks in my ears lately. Have you ever listened to the band Enslaved? No, I've not. Oh, that's like one of the. They have a album from the uh, early 90s and if I was a more prepared person I would be able to tell you this album off the top of my head <laughs> unfortunately I am not so but it is one of the best Viking metal albums ever they've got the heavy like obviously heavy vocal tracks but they have these transitionary things that just sound like dark opera it's beautiful awesome I'll, I'll check it out but yeah so uh I suppose moving forward, uh, we've already kind of hinted where where Arc Two is going to go for uh, for the beauty. But is there anything you want to tease going into about issue seven specifically? Well, um, so uh, I guess I dodged the the. I, I, actually, I'm going to take it back. I'm going to address your earlier question a little bit better, though. So um, I am right now working on a couple of projects. Um, Another one that Hurley and I are co-writing. Uh, it, this one's a horror thing. So back to our earlier stuff about horror. Um, you know, we're uh, we're working on a horror series. Uh, we're going to co-write that one, and uh, we've got a guy lined up to draw that, and he's brilliant. A lot of fun. Um, so that's one of the things we're doing. The other thing. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, co-creating and drawing a new, uh, series that is probably going to be out the end of 2015, early 2016. And, uh, it's going to be basically, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know times. I don't know what dates. <laughs> we're, we're going back in time like beauty, man. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. We do. Um, Dude, I, I, I work in a box. I don't know. I, I don't ever know what day, <laughs> or any, what day of the week or anything. So, yeah. if, if I didn't have alerts on my calendar that my wife gave me, uh, I probably would never know anything at all. <laughs> um, but yeah, so 2000, late 2016, early 2017 for this series. It's going to be uh, with Seth Peck, who was one of my uh, co-creators on Bad Karma, big project we did. He did. He wrote some Wolverine and some uh, 
uh, X Men stuff, and uh, wrote a uh, series with a mini series with um, Recommender a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, he's a lot of fun. But this series is going to be a complete departure from everything. You know, it's not horror. It's not crime it's uh it's actually going to be post apocalyptic high fantasy so it's gonna be uh it's gonna be like think um think walking dead for the d and d crowd basically is what we're gonna be doing mm, interesting interesting um and uh so it takes it back so because of the, those obligations and kind of what i'm doing um we've we're getting we're getting some art help on the beauty for a little while but we're getting really really fantastic guys to come in on the next arc of the beauty uh with number seven we've got uh mike huddleston who you might know from the coffin or butcher baker or recently doing the strain um so he's he's going to be handling our duties on that issue and then uh the rest of the arc is going to be that issue is a one-off it's going to be a standalone. And then uh, the rest of the arc is going to be drawn by uh, Brett Lovely, who uh, co-created the surrogates back in the day. Nice. And he does some amazing, beautiful painted stuff on there. So, Was it kind of tough we, giving yeah, up? Yeah, Fidget Tube and in. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Really great looking stuff. Yeah. Was it kind of tough giving up the uh, kind of handing over the artistic reins for? I mean, this because this is this is your guy's baby, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think that one of the things you know immediately we started talking about this and we were like, you know, scheduling wise, the biggest thing that we realized pretty early on was that I can't you know I can't draw two books anymore you know when i was younger i i could you know i, I didn't have I had two young kids i've got you know an entire I, I need some sleep i'm getting old um but um i you know as much as i would love to draw both books right now it just it, it isn't possible i'll bop i'll bop back in and do more you know it's, it's you know but if you want to keep a book on schedule and if you want to be responsible to, to the readers, you know, you've got to figure out a way to make things happen. And, um, the way that we kind of got around this was by picking guys, you know, the rule was I want artists on this book that are as good or better than I am. And, uh, you know, both of these guys that, that, that are coming on are, are just fantastic. Uh, they're, they're more than I could have asked for and are true collaborators along the way. It's, you know, it's really, really nice. So it's a different thing, but it feels good. Uh, yeah. I mean, Jake used to work at the, uh, at a comic book shop him, uh, himself. Yeah. And, and he was saying like the uh, people at the store really dug well, yeah, it. Yeah. Oh, I, I remember, uh, when issue one of the beauty came out, um, you know, there's multiple covers and that book was like, went like fucking crazy. Um, and I, and also I, you know, just working at a comic shop too. I mean, I, I can tell you, and obviously, you know, working in retail as well, but like, like you were saying the importance of, and the responsibility, I like that you said that, um, of getting the book out to the readers, like the readers definitely appreciate that. And, you know, and like you were saying, even though, um, you know, it is your baby and, you know, working on it with the art, but you know, that responsibility is is more important in getting the the work out there. So that's that definitely, you know, doesn't go unnoticed by the by the people picking up the book. And um like I said, I don't work at the shop anymore, but the yeah, the They sure as hell notice when it's delayed. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But yeah, but no, I, I the the beauty was a big deal when that came out. That was that was big time. So yeah, it's definitely appreciated by by the readers. We I mean, we've been really blown away by the response to it. I um I told this story before, but you know, we when we pitched it to Top Cow, we didn't know if if anybody was going. You know, it's a it's a book about an STD that makes you beautiful. You know, it's 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 something that people are either going to think is awesome or they're just going to be completely turned off by. And we were announcing it at San Diego, um, and we were there with all the other pilot season groups, 
and all the other books, and everybody was giving, you know, their explanation, and I, you know, they were so good, <laughs> and I was intimidated. And I lean forward to give my description, and I'm just like, it's about an STD that makes you beautiful. And, there, and like, the crowd felt silent, and then everybody started laughing, and then everybody started clapping. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. I think well, people are going to dig this. It's funny, because one of the things that I loved working at a comic shop was, like, a really quick one-sentence pitch, and I and I liked... That was basically kind of what we had too, where people would come up and we'd have the new arrival stuff at the front by the cashier, by the cash register, and they'd see the art on the, on the cover, and they, you know there was multiple covers for the first issue, and they were like, "What is this?" And it was basically the same thing. It was like STD that makes you beautiful, and there was like there was always kind of like that look of I have to see what that is, like what does that mean? <laughs> and I mean like yeah, that that easy kind of like one sentence pitch uh, can do wonders. I think that. Look, there are so many good books out right now. There, there's just, I mean, there's no end to what's out. And, you know, I, I, go, I go into the shop and, and visit Hurley, and I'm just, you know, it's, I'm blown away by how many creator-owned things there are to choose from right now. And, and our audiences are expecting more. They, they want good books, and they expect it. And if you want to do something that catches people's eye, you have to really think about it and and do something that that is easily pitchable, it's easily sellable, and then you know leaves you you know with that cliffhanger that you want more of. That's what we tried to do. And I got to say, I mean, from an artistic standpoint, it's one of the most striking just covers with the with the burnt out her husk of a woman on the mm-hmm. cover. And I we read a lot of books for the show, you know, interview a lot of comic book creators and that sort of thing. And so we a lot of the books we read, because I feel like there's a lot of, it's like its own subgenre, kind of like the buddy cop subgenre. Yeah. But this really... Beat the weapon. Yeah, but this really, or Beverly Hills Cop or Beverly 48 Hills. Hours or... This really goes... <laughs> Mostly off, Lethal Weapon, though. Mo- lethal Weapon's the best of, of those three. Um, at least in my opinion. The mm. uh, yes. This book really goes off the rails... I mean, at first you could just be like, well, this is just like some social commentary, but it is very engrossing to, to your guys' credit, and it, it goes in very unexpected places. Um, maybe thanks to, I mean, there's a lot of elements, secret societies. Mr. Calaveras, of course, helps. Yes, definitely. <laughs> All the Calaveras. Yeah. So, yeah, you guys, you guys <laughs> have delivered a top-notch series. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. <laughs> so we are... We are definitely looking forward to see what's coming next. Uh, gentlemen, do you have anything you want to, you know, pitch or, or throw in before, uh, you know, to, to kind of sign off? No, I can't think of anything particular. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. You, 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 you've, been, you've been way too quiet for this. You, uh, that's, we, should, we should probably talk about, about number seven and about, you know, kind of what's coming up just a little bit. Um. You want to do that? No. <laughs> no. No. Joe for it, man. He's silent but deadly with the keyboard. This is how it goes every time. <laughs> uh, um, no. Uh, you know, with, with number seven, uh, like I said earlier, we're we're really kind of we we wanted to with each arc kind of take a look at at different sub themes, and uh, the next arc is about crime. And it's it's really an examination of um, you know you've, you've got you, you ask the question you know what what are people willing to do to look beautiful and the next arc is a lot about um, about being dark on the inside being being you know you've got beautiful people and you've got evil people and uh, what they're willing to do. And uh, number seven focuses on a, a criminal named Timo, and uh, it, it really, you know, he uh, and how the beauty kind of intersects with uh, what he does in his life. Uh, it, it's going to be, it's, it's a brutal, brutal issue, but uh, it was a lot of fun to write. Excellent. We're excited about it. Oh, looking forward to it. Absolutely. Well, Jeremy, Jason, thanks again for coming on the show. The Beauty, Volume 1, is out in comic book shops everywhere in Comixology on Wednesday, March 16th. Um, 
the individual issues are, are there if you want to get them beforehand. But, hey, they'll all be together on March 16th. Definitely check it out. Gentlemen, thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us, man. Well, thanks again, guys, for coming on the show. Uh, yeah. So what you guys been up to this week? I finally purchased a Blu-ray copy of Attack on Titan. And, or not Titan. Fuck. Gah. That was going to be so good. Attack the Block. <laughs> In my opinion, a much better show, but whatever. Uh, uh, or film. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. They had a movie. I don't know. And I, I have watched Attack on Titan. It is exciting. But Attack the Block, in my opinion, better. And like I watched it back when it came out. Loved it. Uh, was like, that that lead kid, he's he's pretty cool. And then, boom, he's the, one of the leads in Star Wars now. John, John Boyega. Uh, but yeah, so I finally got, a, uh, got around to buying my own copy of the blu-ray for it and i watched it uh, actually earlier today and i gotta say still a great movie i want and, and, and i went around and watched uh, the the featurettes because i had a, uh, a little extra time and they have a whole like half hour long featurette talking about how they made the creatures and it was really cool because i remember while i was watching it, i was like how the hell did they do this like i was like i i know how i would do it you know uh, but it wouldn't look good because i don't have the skills of like you know a big hollywood or whatever the English uh, version of Hollywood at Pinewood uh, <laughs> uh, studio behind me. Uh, but turns out they actually did pretty much exactly what I would do. They just, like I said, they have a bigger budget, so it looks better. But like, so it's actually a dude in a furry suit running around and he's got like, you know, a, a clumpy jaw uh, that he can, the, the, that someone else can control, you know, remotely uh, behind the camera. And then they just went in and digitally like erased a lot of the details on it to make it look like just a, a two dimensional silhouette, which I always thought was like the coolest part about it. And it, like, it looks like a really well done digital character. And that's because they did so much, you know, uh, a, a after effects or whatever, uh, program they use to manipulate them, but it's actually a practical monster, which really like shows, uh, like in both the way that, uh, the, the, the characters and the set, you know, react to the, the the creatures running around, and then they went in and just like uh, digitally enhanced the jaws, uh, which uh, I uh, I think was a smart idea because uh, while it still looked good, like they showed some of the raw footage of them running around, like the jaw still looked really cool, but like adding in a lot of the things that they did digitally with like the the way that the jaws moved, extra rows of teeth, and the fact that like it kind of trembled when it would like make it screech just like added so much to it and the fact that like it glowed against this just like two-dimensional silhouette so like that was the only three-dimensional aspect of the creature just made it that much more creepy and like ugh, if you haven't seen it watch it uh and then yeah uh, john boyega's in it he's great it's one of his first big things and then what is this four or five years later is when star wars comes out and now like everyone loves john boyega uh, I get to have that little hipster uh, sense of like <laughs> I knew about him before he was big. I think he was only like twenty, twenty one at the time. I, I, yeah, I think he's playing like a fifteen year old. Uh, but yeah, he's yeah he's like barely twenty uh, at the time that they're filming it. Um, and then uh, the kid who plays the uh, the uh, one half of Firestorm on Legends of Tomorrow, not the uh, uh, who was it, Robbie Amell who played it, Ronnie Raymond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's Jason Rush. Yeah. Uh, it's the, the the second guy that they got to merge with uh, the professor or doctor or whatever. Um, Either is applicable. He is yeah. a doctor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so the second guy, the football player, uh, he's also in the movie as one of John Boyega's uh, uh, gang members. Dennis, I believe, is the character's name. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he does a great job. Nice. Now, there's a pretty big trailer. I guess it's the first official not counting pictures like it's the first official video we've seen of uh the new ghostbusters yeah that was released this week um and the internet cried and cried and cried but you didn't no 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 i'm fucking ecstatic for it because like a true fan i realize that if this film does well we get more of Ghostbusters. Sony Pictures has already created a new production company that it's like, look, if this film does well, we are going to really expand the universe. Mm. 
I find it amazing how your optimism for for Ghostbusters is so uh, so high, and like you love like every like and not and I'm and I'm not and I'm not shooting down the the new Ghostbusters right now, but I love how <laughs> you love everything Ghostbusters except Ghostbusters two. I feel like a true fan would like <laughs> Ghostbusters two. No, a true fan can see the faults of Ghostbusters two. I'm sorry. The fact sorry that I'm not a true fan because yeah. I fucking oh, love man. Ghostbusters I, 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 too. I like, yeah. The, the the fact that the EPA wins. Oh well, I mean that's. I mean uh, I've always cited that. Yeah. I feel no, like I, you. I didn't feel like you didn't bring that up until I brought it up. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's. Uh, I had never noticed it until Sam brought it up, and then I was like, ah, no, yeah. it doesn't ruin the movie. It's still like an enjoyable ride. I, for I me. agree. I agree that it's a shoddy way to get everyone back together, but like, I don't hate it. Yeah. Also, I, and also, I, just, I love just seeing the Statue of Liberty running around New York. Yeah, no, I mean, by an NES advantage. Yeah, yeah, that that was nice. But also the villain. You don't like you, you don't like um, the Vigo, the Vigo, no. the Butch, <laughs> the no. Carpathian, who yeah. apparently was actually a shitty person in real life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, kind of like Tombs from X Files. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank God he's only in season one. Anyway, twice uh, though. Twi- yeah, <laughs> beginning and the end. Yeah. Uh, but I, uh, I feel like a. A true fan would uh, <laughs> would uh, but really. So with with the new Ghostbusters, um, <laughs> you set yourself up. <laughs> yeah, with with the new Ghostbusters, uh, I I have a very neutral outlook on it. Like I'm not, I am definitely not one of the guys. that's just like this movie looks like it's gonna be terrible. It's ruined my childhood. Like yeah. I can still go back and fucking watch the first and the second Ghostbusters movie and be fine. And the real Ghostbusters. Yeah, and the real Ghostbusters car- cartoon. And extreme Ghostbusters. Never watched it. Oh. It looked interesting. But. Or even Filmation's Ghostbusters, which is mm. why the first yeah. cartoon had to be called the real Ghostbusters. <laughs> or uh, the uh, 360 game. Yeah. Or yep. any of the comic books. Yeah. Like yeah. the time they team up with the Ninja Turtles. Yeah. Yeah. Let's be oh, honest. That... Everyone's teaming up with the Ninja Turtles these days. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not complaining. Even, even, <laughs> even <Batman>. Daredevil, technically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Batman it, or, it yeah. Is, is or did. I don't it, know if it's still going on. still in publication. Yeah. Yeah, it's... But, uh, but uh, I, 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 I came out with a very... Oh, reaction to it. Like, uh, I'm fine with there being a new Ghostbusters. And unlike half the internet, I don't give a shit that it's, you know, an all-female lead. That's fine. They can be an all-female franchise. It just... I I didn't really like Bridesmaids, and this just looks like more Okay, so you're not a same. Paul Feig fan. Well... I, I, I hesitate to even say that because there's plenty of things that Paul Feig has done. Freaks and, Freaks and Geeks is one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Right, but I mean but, from like the film. Yeah, I guess like uh, yeah, I, the I don't know. There's something about. I mean, I've been very outspoken with my not being crazy for Melissa McCarthy. Mm. Uh, I'm sure I've talked about it on this show before. Uh, if not, you guys can back me up because I've definitely said it off mic. You have, yeah, indeed. Uh, but, and then Kristen Wiig is kind of hit or miss for me. I feel like I like her mo- almost more in a support capacity. Yeah, like yeah. the Martian and stuff. Mm-hmm. She was amazing in the Martian. Yeah, phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kate McKinnon though. Oh, she, she looks fucking dude. great in this yes. movie. Yeah. yeah. Do, yeah does excited. she have a character name? Um, Fake Egon. Yeah. Not, <laughs> I mean, they say they say her name. I don't remember Fogon? what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I was. I, I think her last name is Holtzman in it. That sounds sure. right. Holtzman sure. it is. That sounds yeah, right. I'll, yeah, I'll I'll trust you. Yeah. I'll trust you more than my memory because I only watched it once, and you're the true Ghostbusters fan. But I uh, I, es- I especially true. love the fact that they're giving her the uh, Egon from the real Ghostbusters. Yes. Look. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That looks great. She's probably based on the one trailer. So I I will asterisk you know everything that I say on that. We only have one trailer. We really have no idea what the movie is going to be like. But based on the one trailer, I feel like she's going to be pretty much the only character that I get behind, like that I really like. I'm not going to say that I hate the rest of them, but like she's top tier for yeah. me. Yeah. Um. I will say though, there are two fan edits. One that uses uh, of <laughs> thirty seconds of a trailer. Well, no, it's like a minute thirty. No, but still, well, like... the fan edits they cut all the humor out. One does a more feel similar to the uh, Extreme Ghostbusters opening, which they use music from that, okay. and then the other one uses the music from the original film, and again cuts all the humor out. Mm-hmm. Okay, and sounds like some true fans. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> don't get me wrong. He, 
That's even, like those people that recut like trailer for the 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 Shining and made it look like a a romp, <laughs> like <laughs> or or Mary Poppins made or it look when like a ABC movie. Family made the the, the ABC Family <laughs> TV spot for Batman Begins. Yeah, <laughs> fights for family and love. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, even the fan edits, I love. Yeah, eh, that's good. Uh, I don't like that it the the this trailer started out looking like they were setting it up to be a sequel. By like thirty years ago, scientists, you know, the, these four guys banded together to become the Ghostbusters, and now bitches are doing it again. Not but, to say they're bitches, I'm just that's just you, a word you would that, say it if they were male. Yeah, I, exactly. I know, I know your yeah. your vernacular. And, <laughs> yeah, but I'm like that. I I understand Sorry. why they did it. Uh-huh. You know, it's the same reason why they tried so hard to get all of the original mm-hmm. cast members in the film is that they thought, okay, look, we know that if we pander enough to the fans of the originals they will just open arms accept this so we got to reference you know the old characters we got to reference the original story sadly that kind of backfired in a lot of ways too well they're doing it they're doing it uh to forsake the story because this is from my understanding a solid reboot where the previous ghostbusters did not exist Right. It's just these four ladies. Right. Yeah. And so that, I have a problem as a storyteller. I have a problem with that. Yeah. But also in a really weird uh, weird way, and of with the production company that Sony created for this one, they're also trying to, with this one, create a shared universe of Ghostbusters films as well. See, now, this is edging towards what I would have preferred to see in a new Ghostbusters movie. Uh, specifically, like, not a reboot. doesn't have to be a direct sequel. Just something that exists within the universe. There's tons of opportunity for them to have, like, millions of satellite franchises. They could have chosen yeah. a different city. They could have been in Chicago or L.A. or Hotlanta. You know, hmm. something, so- something else. Like, it didn't have to be New York. Uh, although... Yay, it's New York again. You know, like it. Uh, Only in setting, to... not in complete filming. No, they filmed <laughs> mostly in Boston. Well, as you know. Hell, it could have been set in Boston. Yeah. yeah. As you as you well know, the uh, other two, what, all the interiors were filmed in Los Angeles, or yeah. most of them? Yeah, mm-hmm. which also they show in the trailer that a lot of Eagle Eye fans' spot is that uh, the firehouse that they are filming inside of in one of the scenes, I want to say, is the firehouse they used in la as well mm. oh i will say like you know i like the um the faux science that they put into with the gear i do like the mm. i mean i uh, the slapdash it, look of it yeah, yeah it does look more homemade yeah, yeah. Well, and and the ecto i can never dislike well unless they make it like fucking awful but i can never mm. dislike the the ecto one i mean it's still a cadillac yeah well it's yeah, still a hearse it's still a hearse yeah yeah uh yeah, I mean, Jake, are you ambivalent to the whole thing? Yeah, right. I mean, I, I, I think this whole backlash thing. I mean, again, the backlash thing is something that happens with everything ever yeah. now, um, and it it brings me great joy that the movie's happening regardless yeah. of the backlash. I'm still gonna see um, because I, I I have no problem with it. I, I'm not as uh, I mean I liked I played with Ghostbusters toys when I was a kid. I, I like Ghostbusters, but I don't I I, I couldn't I, I get one and two confused. I don't even remember. But um, <laughs> well, two's the better one. Okay. Yeah. Note to self. Who's got the, Vigo the Carpathian? Yeah, who's yeah. actually? I'll take over. <laughs> you're not gonna, you're and <laughs> and I, I will say, Annie Potts got to uh, flex off her good looks a lot more in the second one. Well, and she's got the real Ghostbusters design. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, no, I mean, like I said, Kate McKinnon, I like a lot on SNL. I think she's super, yeah. super fucking funny and talented. Um, I like um, Melissa McCarthy from the Gilmore Girl days. Like she's, it's it's crazy to like when I was watching that show, she was like, I was like, oh man, she's really funny, like an untapped comedy thing she's like you know fucking massive now with like doing everything which is cool um you know Kristen Wiig is it's, it's cool because uh Kate McKinnon is kind of like the next generation's Kristen Wiig we you know Tina Fey Kristen Wiig Kate McKinnon in my opinion yeah. it's kind of you know SNL is like you know really uh creating these great comics no love for um, Amy Poehler I, well, no, Amy. Po- I love Amy, Amy Poehler. Poehler. You prefer Amy yeah, Poehler's my, the perfect woman. Uh, yeah, um, and, and uh, it, between Tina Fey and Amy Poehler, I also prefer Amy Poehler. Yeah, yeah. but uh, she's not in this Faye. movie, unfortunately. Where, where, where you fall on this one, Poehler? 
Yeah, uh, I'd be team Faye, but I appreciate both of them. I mean, I obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah. you don't have to. Ch- it's yeah, not Sam, like you're, Sam wasn't like fuck you. Amy Poehler. Uh, I, I refuse to watch Parks I just, and Rec. I bought you know I bought season two of Parks and Rec for ten dollars. Fuck my Earth. favorite part of Whiskey Tango Foxtrot is that Amy Poehler isn't in it. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone actually see that? No, not yet. No, I'm going to. I think my my mom my and sister theater? are going to go or something. You saw something. I saw, Eddie, gears. I saw Eddie the Eagle, <clears throat> and to, yeah, just real quick, I am excited for Ghostbusters, but um, that's all I got to say about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, Matt, fuck them. Yeah, yeah, fuck them. Yeah, we'll all see it. Yeah, regardless. I yeah, I, I would love to watch it opening weekend, mm-hmm. but uh, because it does look exciting. It's Ghostbusters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that too. Like, there's a part of me. Sorry to yeah. jump back on Ghostbusters, but there's a, there's a part of me that's always going to be excited to see the words Ghostbusters on any screen. We true fans. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just going to be, and like, there's a part of me that's just like, fuck yeah, Ghostbusters. And then the other part of me that's like more like of like the, the, the filmmaker, the, the storyteller and all that shit that, uh, that's like, uh, I'm hesitant. <laughs> when I see those opening titles, yeah. opening night, or I'm like, going to be crying. Or hear like, <laughs> hear, hear the music cue. Da, na, da, na, da, da, even if it is, you know, dub stepped up or, you know, whatever. Two the streets. Yeah, yeah. So Jake, sorry. Um, Eddie the Eagle. Eddie the Eagle. I saw Eddie the Eagle and... Like I was, I was telling Sam earlier, I wasn't trying to be funny, but I saw it, uh, and I went to the grocery store after to get some dinner, and I got home and I was like, "What was I doing for the past two hours?" <laughs> like I forgot that I saw Eddie the Eagle. Um, it's a bummer because like I wanted to really like it. I thought it was going to be like a you know stand up and cheer you know fucking root for Eddie the, you know the Eagle kind of thing, and it, it it succeeds at points in that it's you know ski jumping. I that was always my favorite um, winter uh, Olympic event with ski jumping because it's so fucking out of its mind it's just you're, it's like every reason you should crash and burn but like they're like nope i'm gonna go fucking and jump you know off a fucking ramp on a ski um but it's 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 really weird because uh is it is it taron edgerton who plays eddie the eagle yes you know he's a good looking guy you know from from uh, uh kingsman kingsman fame and i think he's also in legend uh, which i bought the tom hardy movie but Eddie the Eagle, you know, Eddie has a very kind of like particular look to him. And so like Taron does a good job looking like him, but it kind of comes off as like an SNL skit at points. Because he's constantly having to like jut out. His Juttos, yeah. And then, you know, Hugh Jackman's fine. He's fine. But it's again, it just. I, for, it's for, no X-Men movie. Yeah. For me, it, it's no Chappie. For me, it, <laughs> um, no the prestige. It, uh, it kind of misfires a lot um, and doesn't really hit. Like I was waiting for that big payoff moment, and there there is a bit of it, you know, because it's very much the dad doesn't believe in him the whole time. You're wasting your life, wasting your life. Um, but like I said, in real life, the Eddie the Eagle story is pretty amazing because I think it was the same year the bobsled team with Jamaica. They make a reference to it. It was um, uh, at one point they're like, "Can uh, this Jamaican bobsled team, you know, upset the Eddie the Eagle thing?" And so yeah, you know, the British didn't have a fucking ski jump team since like 1928 there was like one dude so there's like really no records so eddie's first jump when he gets in the olympics is a world record is a record for the for the brits and he's going crazy and you know everyone loves him you know he re- he wins him over because he's a nice guy he really is and the famous thing that they kind of point out and it's cool because they show the actual eddie and they show the actual scene in the movie they don't do that weird like fucking photoshop thing on him uh he gets uh called out at the the final night of the olympics when they're saying everything like you know we've seen you know gold and you know blah 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 and we've even seen eagle soar or whatever when he stands up he's like ah you know um but again it's it's one like if you're gonna watch i'd say check it out like you know rent it or something for two bucks when it comes out it's it's fine it's a fan it's, it'd be a fun family movie but for me i was a little i was disappointed by it just formula yeah yeah and it's just w- kind of weirdly paced too you know, like they play, like they play off uh, a couple moments. They play off um, you know, when he crashes. Like it's funny, but it it's not because like these guys are getting fucked up. And there's there's one scene where you see uh, he's like trying because there's different slopes, you know, to practice on. And Eddie's on like the junior junior slope, you know. And he's like can't can't even land that. And uh, Hugh Jackman's like bless you. Hugh Jackman's like. You want to fucking see how to do this shit? Watch this guy. This is number two guy in the world, and he crashes and burns. And he's like, "You think he's fu- you think he's dead?" They have to get like you know an ambulance out. But my favorite scene, real quick, is um, as they're going. I don't, I don't know if this ever happened. It'd be so fucking cool if it did happen. But um, Eddie is in the elevator going up to to make his jump for the ninety meter, the big final jump at the Olympics. And with him in the elevator is the number one ski jumper in the world, and he's Swedish, of course. And they're they're talking to each other, and you know Eddie's like, "Hey, you know you're the best. You did a really great job." 
and he's like, all I want to do is my best. I don't care if I win gold. If I'm in last place, but I know I did my best, that's all that matters. And he looks at Eddie, who is like the worst ski jumper in the world, but he's in the Olympics and setting records for the Brits. He's like, you and me are the same. And Eddie's like, what? You know, because this is like the best ski jumper in the world. It's like, you know, Mickey Mantle talking to me in an elevator going up to, I don't know why I'd be going up anywhere in an elevator. But, um, and, you know, he's like, if we don't try our best today, then what's the point? Like, it doesn't matter if I win gold, you know, you, you, you know, whatever. Like, as long as you know you try the best, that was, that's what makes, that's, separates us from everybody else. And then kind of like a true badass, the guy who goes out and sets a world record on that jump. And then the next jump is Eddie, who, you know, does his personal best and the place goes crazy because he's never landed a 90 foot or 90 meter jump in his life before he decides to do it um, at the Olympics. And he like the 90 foot one, as they say, were like there's the 40 foot where it's like you or 40 meter where you kind of just fuck around. That's why you you train on like you can get a bruise yourself. There's a 70 meter, which is you break bones. And they said the 90 meter, if you crash, you're basically dead um, because it's just the force that you're going to hit it with. Um, but yeah, like it, it's, that's about it for Eddie the Eagle. <laughs> I, I'd say go read about the real guy. He's fascinating. There is, honestly, there's really nothing between now and Batman v Superman that I want to watch. I'm aware of 10 Clever, Cloverfield Lane comes out. It's more the novelty of Cloverfield Lane. I, I'm not going to rush not, out. I'm not going to rush out, but I'll see it. Not Zootopia? I might see it on a discount day. Yeah. Yeah. I hear um, very good thing. Yeah, yeah. No. Ooh. So my theater had <laughs> a screening, a private screening uh, for a big group of furries, and it was awesome. Okay. Right. <laughs> uh, oh, Alamo. You can I reserve mean, any theater. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but I just, I, I would imagine they the Alamo were, would have been more to they, accept it. They, they, we were. Uh, they were, they were very well behaved. Uh, they, you know, they came in, they went out, they. The people there, there were little kids there that were like, "Oh, hey, little fox, I want to take a picture," and like they were like, "Cool, take a picture." They, you know, they paid handsomely, uh, as you know, good citizens are wont to do. They uh, paid with photos of Henry Cavill. Yeah. They were like, yeah. <laughs> "That's yeah. handsome." Yeah, Here. exactly. Oh, I got a Clooney. It's a Clooney. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> oh, thank you for your Henry Cavill. I'll get you a Tom Hardy. Yeah, as your Tom change. Hardy is your change. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> all I got are Jake Bozix. That ain't gonna get you shit. Mm, that's gonna get you kicked out. Yeah, get but out yeah, of here, no, you I'm, son of a bitch. I'm excited to see Ten Cloverfield Lane. Yeah, so am I. I'm huge fan of the first one. I, you know, I enjoyed the first one. Um, it doesn't have a replay value though. Yeah, that's no, sure. I have, yeah, yeah. There's just like I wasn't like Maybe chomping once. It. Yeah, I'm not saying I'll never see. I'm, not, I'm like that fucked up well, for life. Yeah, you yeah. know, I mean, it's, it's not Foxcatcher. Well, it's funny you say <laughs> that though because. Uh, I was over at a friend's house, I want to say, this past weekend, and... Um, they said fuck 10 Cloverfield Lane? <laughs> yeah, well, no, no, no. They, uh, a friend of ours who'd come over they hadn't... Fuck Sam Stone. Hadn't seen it yet. So we watched it again, and watching, I was surprised that uh, the character of HUD, which both brilliant and horrible pun at the same time, um, was played by T.J. Miller. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, you're right. In and, fact, there um, was like a lot of stars in it that you go back and watch. Now it's like, shit, did they all get their start here? And uh, what's her name? Um, uh, from uh, she was in like the first season of True, True Blood. Blood, and yeah. uh, and, yep. and Lizzie Girls. Kaplan. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. I love Lizzie Kaplan. She's was, great. Uh, she was she was actually the only uh, actress in the, the or the actor at period in it that I uh, recognized before seeing the movie and I was like oh fuck yeah she's in it uh-huh. and then she explodes she goes out fucking yeah. hard yeah yep the yeah. hardest spoiler yeah yes. uh, 10 years old almost almost god Jeez. Yeah. I think it was in college when that movie came yeah, out yeah 2007 2008 I think somewhere around there yeah wow. Um. yeah again I enjoyed the first film it just was like well and again I th- I may very well see 10 Cloverfield Lane I'm just not like chomping at the bit like oh yeah I just I, yeah. I want to see how it connects where in the universe it fits because you know JJ's gone on to say several times like not really a monster in this doesn't connect how you might think I feel like it's more exploring the fallout mm-hmm. of it yeah uh, that's yeah. what I think I the, the 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 second trailer where you get to see a little bit of like John Goodman's characters like uh, nefarious side uh, like almost like a, a rear window at type uh, element to it I was just like fuck yes <laughs> and also, it's funny because his character, uh, much like with the first one, they have a lot of viral marketing going into this one where you really have to go out of your way to find. There's like a huge backstory for his character. Like he's uh, someone that works like in a scientific field, you know, uh, studying images from um, satellites and telescopes and things like that. Like and so he's, he's like a Jor-El. 
Yeah, well, he he's not like a doomsday planner, like just right from the get go. Yeah, for me, the coolest thing, the coolest shot in the entire movie, is when uh, I guess Mary Elizabeth Weinstead's run out, and I always think it's the coolest fucking thing. Like the light shines from behind the house. Oh yeah, and the way it casts that shadow. I thought that's yeah. the coolest shot. Yeah, it's got like a uh, close encounters kind of feel to it, but something more sinister. Oh about yeah, it. yeah, definitely. So I'll, I mean, that's the big. Again, I'll, I'll probably see it at some point. I can almost guarantee I'll see it at some point. I just don't. I just probably won't see it opening night. <laughs> but also, if like this one does well, there's plans for a third there you that go. they want to do and that would connect both of the first and this film together. And Ghostbusters. <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> That's right. Because J.J. Abrams. Yeah. True fan. <laughs> <laughs> Damn he right. He just has Vigo, the, the Carpathian, <laughs> come in and he's controlling the the Cloverfield monster. Yeah, <laughs> well, shit. <laughs> After after they vanquish him, you get a buff portrait of J.J. Abrams, <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then and then the the the, 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 the Cloverfield monster is just running around with like the giant Stay Puft Marshmallow Man and the Statue of Liberty, <laughs> and whatever giant uh, yeah. thing the the new Ghostbusters uses at the end. The cool thing about it, I think, if it follows formula, my my favorite shot, I think, in the new Ghostbusters, at least the trailer. If we're talking like favorite shots and trailers, is uh, when you see all the ghosts floating around Times Square. Yeah, yeah, because looks... you kind of get like a time travel effect that happens where a lot of the billboards switch to like things from the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as if they're being possessed, just like Melissa McCarthy. Yeah, Ooh. and it's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, I'll, I'll yeah. So, anybody got anything else to add? Uh, yeah. Also, a bit of sad movie news mm. this past week. The uh, Sandman Project lost its director and rumored to be lead star, yeah. um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Which, which worries me a lot because Joseph Gordon-Levitt was such a huge advocate for it. Like, if he's leaving the project, what does that well, mean about what's going on with the movie? Which was the same thing that made me very hesitant, and thankfully I was proven wrong after I saw it, but about Ant-Man since uh, you know uh, Edgar Wright left the project and I was like what the fuck he was literally the only person saying we need to make this movie and if he's now saying never mind I don't want to make it what shit show are we going to get he uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt has left for the exact same reason because the studio that was originally going to make it the Warner Brothers proper right uh they created a new studio that handles all the Vertigo properties well they they Gave all their Vertigo properties to New Line, which is their right. subsidiary. Yes. New 52 line. And, um, <laughs> and Jessica Levitt was working with New Line on it. They kept they kept butting heads on what he wanted to be in this film, and that's why he left. And he's a true fan. Hmm. Yeah, he's, so, yeah. So, yeah, you have every right now to be worried about the project. <laughs> yeah. But again, I was, uh, I was also proven wrong with Ant-Man because Ant-Man... Uh, at the time it came out was like my one of my like top five you know Marvel movies probably top three like slightly below Guardians um, and Winter Soldier yeah yeah so like w- not sure the exact order but those three were like in my top three when Ant Man came out now with Deadpool it's a little bit shook up even though that's not Marvel MCU proper yeah right? but Ant Man was like a big f- breath of fresh air compared to mm-hmm. age of ultron a breast of fresh air if i may reference wild wild west no one's stopping you <laughs> and <laughs> they wish i would <laughs> also do we have any death wish fans here mm-hmm. is in like, like the movie yes with charles bronson yes that's that gonna, one that's going to be rebooted yep with bruce willis yep so yeah oh boy just like die hard five huh have ever anybody here actually see a good day to die hard. No, yes. but there's no. a. Oh, you have. Yes. There's a part I, of me that wants to. I, I watched oh like the first God. twenty minutes on TV, like the the network television edit of it. I saw an everything wrong with thing, and I was watching it, and like usually those videos are funny, like oh, like you know, a little thing here or there. But it got to a point where they were just like, Jesus Christ! Like they'd be like, you know, he's driving in a car, and the like the 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 wide shot. There's no bridge, and then like. When he gets in the car, there's a bridge and the le- it just like crazy con- continuity errors. Like they're just really, really bad. And the fact that he's like immortal, you know, <laughs> that took a lot of the fun out of it. Well, he's yeah. been immortal since like four. Die Hard Two. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Like when he like ejects out and like. I guess yeah. The, the yeah. coolest part, I think, the coolest thing in Die Hard Two is the fact that the general can kick the shit out of him. Mm. It shows that he's not like super gung ho mm-hmm. fucking like John McClane. Yeah, I like yeah. Like yeah. And I then like, like he's like rock he gets bottom rocked in three. In, yeah. yeah, with Avengers. I like mm. beat up. 
John McCain. John McClane. <laughs> I mean, what are you like? <laughs> what is Vietnam? this, the Vietnam War? <laughs> oh, and also the great uh, thing about it too is they can make it look like it's actually fun to go to Dallas Airport. Mm, even though it doesn't look like it at all. No, nope. <laughs> but that, that's part of the magic. Yeah. But clearly, security was very lax back in the eighties. Oh yeah, it Just does like have everything my, else. Was. It does. I've said it before. I'll say it again, and I'll probably say it in the future. It does Man, have my. I love f- being a t- It has my favorite YPK motherfucker though. With the lighter and the fucking plane. Yeah. He, I was like, who's he saying it to? <laughs> the audience. Although, if it, it, it's it's not, I guess, canon technically, but the original ending of 3 is the best yippee ki motherfucker. Oh, with a rocket launcher? Yeah. yeah. Rocket launcher. <laughs> Metal does slug he, reference. Yeah. Does, he, does he launch it into the helicopter? No, he launches it into him. Into Jeremy Irons. Yeah. <laughs> it's like he spins it around. I, like, need to, I need to see it's this. It's fucking great. It's on the DVD. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I, need, I need to good, rewatch. I, need I have to, it right there. I need to rewatch that trilogy. I mean, like you know, four is fun. I mean, four, four is a, ridiculous, but it's I'll fun. Take four over two. Yeah, yeah. I, I would too. I would too. Four as well. I will say, I was so. I like that. Oh, yeah. I like that, uh, that, that, that. That Bruce Willis shoots himself in yeah. the hero spot. Yippee ki yay, motherfucker! I hated though when I saw it in the theaters. Like the gunshot covers, covers the fucker. fucker, and I'm like, you could say fucker, and I was like, that that fucking pissed me off so bad. <laughs> and then the, I got like the unrated one. They add like you know CG squib or CG blood and then he's, you can hear him say motherfucker although in the trailer for four there's a, he says yippee ki motherfucker a different way in the trailer like it's not but and it's not in the movie <laughs> yippee ki yay motherfucker yeah. did we talk about really quick that one time he was being interviewed like live while watching a basketball game and the guy was like it's live so they couldn't you know they, could, they didn't have a delay because it's a fucking bad and so the guy walks up to him he's like hey with us we got Bruce Willis hey Bruce how's it going hey man I'm just fucking watching this game he's like hey uh you're, you're filming uh the new Die Hard, or, you know, or something at the time. He's like, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah I've been looking forward to it. He's like, all right, well, you yippee ki Bruce. And he's like, yippee ki motherfucker. And they just cut, like, quickly back to, like, the sports guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he later, like, was like, look, I just got off, like, a fucking, like, all-night flight. Well, also, like, the, the, what is it? Would it be the Pavlo, like, the response of every, yeah. you hear him saying that? He would yeah. just immediately say it, because yeah. he's been saying it for... And it's not like the guy went up to him and was like, hey, Bruce, we're live. Yeah. <laughs> Again. He's used to how being cool is it? a taped interview. How cool is it that like a catchphrase gets reworked as a new catchphrase? Like right? That doesn't happen, really. Like yeah. It'd be like if someone turned Hayo Silver into a new Hi-Yo catchphrase. Silver, motherfucker. I'm looking. Hey, fucking. Uh, I, I know um, One-Armed Ollie showed up in Legends of Tomorrow. Yep. I doubt he said Hayo Goddamn Silver, which Frank Miller, you know, that's what he says in Dark Knight Returns. But I would love to see that happen eventually and become like a thing. So you should tweet at him. Yeah, Hayo Goddamn Silver. You should just t- t- like take that film, uh, yeah, there, take that, take that uh, panel, uh, yeah, take that panel and uh, tweet at him. And be like, hey, was this in that episode of Legends well, of Tomorrow? Hey, you know, at the rate the DC films have been going, hey, man. if mm-hmm. they ever add a Green Arrow character, yeah. it'll happen. Hayo Goddamn Silver. <laughs> No, hashtag no jokes, only dark. Yep, mm. dark, all dark all, all the time. Dark, all dark night. But uh, yeah. Speaking of that, did you, did you guys rem- uh, see someone, uh, some film editor went through and took Man of Steel and was like, if it was properly colored and like just basically the brightness is turned mm-hmm. up, it looks so good. Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah, I, yeah the suit because actually it was looked so, blue. It was so yeah. well shot. Like here's the thing, <laughs> and then they just fucking the the desaturated it all. Yeah, with Batman, fine. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're going to get it the solo back. Yeah. But Superman, like, when he's in Smallville, like, that's one of the great things about Superman 78. When he's in Smallville, it looks like a beautiful fucking painting, you know? Like, and, and that, 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 that blue and red should, and yellow should pop. Whatever. For our full thoughts on the man, on Man of Steel, we've got a commentary incoming. I mean, at this point, you've probably seen that we just posted the commentary for Superman Four. Probably, probably have figured out that we're going to do more Superman movies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're not stopping at Quest for Peace. There's a couple more to come. Yeah, we don't hate you all that much. I mean, <laughs> we do like to end on a high note. <laughs> so oh. let's get there. Oh, yeah. oh so true. Yeah, sad but true. <laughs> 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 This has been another episode of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Jake. I'm Josh. Sad but true. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye, Girl Scout Cookies.